Next on Max TV, we take a look at the executioner. Bernard Hopkins destroys Kelly Pallet, and we have news and notes coming up on the next round. Welcome to the next round, Steve Kim, joined as always by the editor-in-chief of Max Boxing, Doug Fisher. A jam-packed show. We begin round number one, where it was unstoppable and we had an execution. Bernard Hopkins with a clear-cut 12-round decision over Kelly Pavlich, shocking the world once again. Your scores, 119-106, 118-108, and 117-109. On the undercard, WBO featherweight titleist Stephen Luevano keeps his title. The 12 round decision over the awkward, difficult Billy Div. And middleweight eliminator Marco Antonio Rubio in a good, solid fight with a 12 round decision over Enrique Ornelas. Doug, I traveled 3,000 miles from LA to Philadelphia and Atlantic City to see this fight. And it's not often you see such a lopsided 12 round whitewash and you say to yourself, wow, I saw something historic. But what Bernard Hopkins did was absolute brilliance. Yeah, it was the kind of fight where even if you were a Bernard Hopkins hater or somebody who was skeptical of his middleweight accomplishments, someone who considered him a good hard-nosed fighter, uh, definitely accomplished, um, definitely special in terms of his longevity, but not special in terms of his talent, not like a pound-for-pound all-timer mm. type of fighter. It was the kind of performance that if, if your eyes haven't already been opened to how great Bernard truly is, they were open Saturday night with this one-sided performance over Kelly Pavlik. I think most people believe that he'd finally gotten old, that he finally turned the corner, he was finally on the downside of, of, of a, a first ballot Hall of Fame career. And, and this is the mark of a great fighter. He can prove us wrong, not once, not twice, but he can prove some of us wrong three and four times because he challenges himself, Steve. I mean, after the fight, Bernard was, was very emotional and staring down the media. You could see his bottom mm. lip kind of quivering a little bit, and he was, said something to the effect, I'm tired of having to prove myself. Like, well, Bernard, it's your fault because you challenge yourself. You pick out a strong, young, undefeated champion like Kelly Pavlik, and people think, you know what? You might be good for half a fight. You cannot outbox this guy or dominate him for an entire fight, but that's exactly what he did. Uh, Doug, he says he's tired, but he loves the media. Guys like him that say, I don't care what you guys say, they absolutely care about it. And a guy like Bernard Hopkins, that has been gasoline to his tank. I think Bernard Hopkins was brilliant in so many ways. He gave an exhibition, a clinic on Boxing 101, moving, sidestepping, fainting, timing and his hand speed and reflexes, Doug, I'll say it right now, at 43 years old, put aside Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens and their performances, which were very, very tainted, it turns out. You take a look at Jack Nicholas, who won the Masters at age 46, didn't have anyone hitting him, but if you take a look at George <laughs> yeah. Foreman, who landed basically one miracle punch against Michael Moore, and then Archie Moore, who went life and death in hitting the canvas three times against Yvonne Durrell, this may be not only the best old performance in boxing, but maybe in all of sports. Yeah, well, I, I, will de I just know boxing, Steve. Um, and, and I will say this. That was the best 40-year-old-plus boxing clinic mm. I have ever seen. And I will say that Bernard Hopkins is the best preserved boxer with 20 years of professional experience under his belt. It was not a surprise, Steve, that the lateral movement, the counterpunching, mm. The style and the, the ring experience would trouble young Kelly Pavlik, who's still green at age 26, yep. even after 30 professional fights. The guy has 30 knockouts. He'd only gone past nine rounds once. What was surprising, maybe even shocking, was the, the fact that Bernard was th that much faster. Yes, he was. And that his, his feet and his hands were that much faster, and that his, reflex, his reflexes were that lightning quick. That's what shocked me. That is what enabled him. You, you knew that Bernard was going to create openings. You knew Bernard was going to see openings. You didn't know if Bernard could take advantage of those openings for 12 rounds of the fight as effectively as he did and as dominantly as he did and to, 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 the, to the effect where he was buzzing Kelly Pavlik even early in the fight. Uh, and the fact that he looked like he was trying to close the show in the 12th round. It looked like, well, he might knock this guy down or maybe even knock him out. The, Doug, the, the heat that he was putting on the young Doug, man. This is the best Bernard Hopkins I've seen in person since September 9, 2001 when he undressed and exposed Felix Trinidad at the Madison Square Garden 
I really believe that this performance here is a capper. It really is, could be his defining moment in the sport of boxing because absolutely nobody, and I think me and you were included, really yeah. gave him a shot to perform in this manner. I think to me he did a brilliant job of never letting Kelly Pavlik set his feet and never getting into a certain distance where Kelly Pavlik could be dangerous. And Doug, what impressed me was not only did he see openings and take advantage of them, in this fight, and maybe this says a lot about Joe Calzaghe and his boxing acumen, he made his own openings and he exploited them. Yes, he did. And he had the, the athleticism. That, that's, the, that's the crazy thing. At age 43, we know that he has the ring IQ to take over a fight against a fighter who doesn't have his experience uh, and is not as versatile, uh, versatile a boxer mm -hmm. or complete a fighter a as he is. But the fact that he, he was the stronger man inside, Steve, the fact that he had the quicker reflexes, the fact that his hand-eye coordination was far superior to that of a man who was 17 years mm -hmm. his junior, that is the really amazing thing. That is just one of the things that makes Bernard Hopkins so special. And I'll tell you what really makes him special in, in this era of fighters is that he truly is a complete fighter. He was somebody who had the dedication and the willingness to learn from an old school trainer, Bowie Fisher, who's, who's no longer in his corner, but I will say this, Nazim Richardson yeah. was, was excellent uh, in between rounds and obviously during their camp. But, but what really makes him special is that he can do it all, Steve. He learned it all. With Bowie Fisher, he took his time, and, and this guy was a, a work in progress from the early 90s all the way to the end of that decade. And beginning with this decade, Steve, he is not only the best middleweight, but one of the best fighters pound for pound because he can do it all. He can fight coming forwards, he can fight going backwards, he can fight side to side, he can stick and move, he can pressure a guy, he can get in there and maul, he can fight off the ropes. He has every punch, every punch in the book. And really for the first time in a long time, we saw him employ all these punches and combination punches. It wasn't just his left yeah. jab, it was a left hook. It was a left to the body. It was the left to the body and straight right combination. He was putting together two and three punch combinations all night long, and it was really a pleasure to watch. Doug, taking a look at the vanquished Kelly Pavlik, I think a couple of things are very obvious. Number one, movement is going to give him problems. He has big, heavy feet, and he's a guy like I talk about. He's the locomotive on the train track. A to B, he's great, but if you sidestep him, he's going to have problems resetting. And Doug, he might be one of those fighters because I've seen 24 rounds above the middleweight limit, 166 and now 170. He simply is not that effective. He was never able to get his feet underneath him, never was able to punch with a lot of leverage. And Doug, he looked like a very stationary target. He just may be, in fact, a very, very good middleweight who's going to struggle above 161 pounds. I, I, I think that's been proven with uh, the um, closer than expected decision victory over Jermaine Taylor and now this one-sided loss to Bernard Hopkins. What it does uh, do, Steve, is uh, create some interesting matchups at 160 pounds. Uh, fights w that were originally seen as blowouts for Kelly Pavlik, it, now when you match him with uh, a fighter who can stick and move, like an Alan Green, yeah. if Alan Green can, can make 160 pounds, or if they fight at a 163 or 164 pound catch weight, or an eventual showdown with Andre Ward or Andre Jarrell, whereas maybe before this fight people would say, nah, Kelly's too big, he's too strong, he's too busy, he hits yeah. too hard for those guys. Now you look at their style, the fact that they have quick hands, the fact that they employ lateral movement, and you think, you know what? These are competitive fights, and, Doug, and I think competitive fights are good for boxing. Doug, and here's another thing. The first loss is always the unknown. We don't know if Kelly Pavlik is psychologically altered forever or if he indeed becomes a better fighter. That is the big question. And Doug, his next fight will come in February, from what I've been told, against Marco Antonio Rubio, who won the WBC Eliminator by surging strong against Enrique Ornelas. And Doug, this is a guy that has slowly rebuilt his career into a very productive one. The first time we saw him live ringside was September of 2003, when he took an ill-advised fight against Kofi Gentil and was promptly starched in about 54 seconds. But Doug, <laughs> this is a guy, he's a good sound puncher, he's a good sound boxer, there you and go. I think he's exactly the type of style Kelly Pavlik needs to bounce back against Bernard Hopkins. He's an aggressive boxer puncher, Steve, yeah. and his career really started to take off once he stepped up from junior middleweight to middleweight, and once he started putting boxing and technique yeah. in front of power punching. 
when he's boxing as a heavy-handed fighter, he's really fun to watch because he's an aggressive boxer. And that's what Kelly Pavlik needs. He needs a dance par partner. Actually, he needs a partner who doesn't dance. Yeah. <laughs> he needs a partner who's going to exchange and, and who's there to be hit. But you know what? He, he's smart enough. He's got enough footwork and he's got a decent enough jab where he can present some problems and take Kelly some, some quality rounds. And I think that's what Kelly needs. Doug, Rubio Ornelas was an outstanding fight down the stretch. I really thought Ornelas, with his quickness and his hand speed, built up an early lead. Rounds 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, I thought the heavy-handedness of Rubio won this fight. Doug, speaking of a fight that wasn't a fight, this is the last <laughs> I see of Billy Dibb. My slanted eyes will have no tears coming out of it. Man, Billy Dibb, he's from Australia down under and in the state. <laughs> way, 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 way down under. I don't think he deserved this title shot. No. And um, if he ever gets another undeserved title shot, that's fine. I just hope it doesn't happen in the United States, and I hope it isn't televised here in America. D uh, Doug, to give Stephen Lueveno credit, I thought he held his poise a lot with some of those dirty tactics that had me reminiscing about Fritzy Zivic. I think <laughs> Lueveno is a guy that's turned into a real solid fighter, one of the best three or four featherweights in the world, and I thought he did just as much as you can do against an awkward guy like Dib. Yeah, I, I look forward to seeing him in with the likes of Mario Santiago. That rematch yeah. should, be, should be fun to watch, and I don't know who wins that fight. Um, Elio Rojas, um, uh, down from Mexico. Jorge Solis is a very good boxer who's been winning a lot. He deserves a title shot. Maybe down the line, Yuri Orcas Gamboa. That's a fun fight. That's a fight mm -hmm. that he, he can definitely get on HBO. So, at least boxing after dark. Absolutely. So that was it. The execution was unstoppable for Bernard Hopkins. We come back. We go to News and Notes. And moving on with the next round, we go to news and notes, taking a look at the fight preview Thursday night on Versus. For the vacant IBF featherweight title, Orlando Salido takes on Cristobal Cruz. And it's also the pro debut of 2008 U.S. Olympian Demetrius Andrade. Then Friday on Telefe Church, the return of Daniel Ponce de Leon. And your main event, Saul Alvarez, takes on Larry Mosley. Doug Salido, Cristobal Cruz, I think is a good fight. But I think Orlando Salido is the sleeper. I think he's the dark horse. He might even be the best two or three fighter in this division. I think he gives anyone a tough night. I expect him to be much too strong for Cristobal Cruz. Yeah, well, I think he's the most dangerous, riskiest fighter for, for any of the young title holders to take on at 126 yeah. pounds. He's got the experience. He's a very good athlete. He's strong, as you say. But he has underrated technique and boxing ability. And I think he's going to use that boxing ability to outbox Cristobal Cruz. Uh, but it should be fun to watch because Cruz is as tough as they come. Um, he's always in very good condition. He's also very experienced, just not as talented no. as Salido. And I, I think I, that's I, the bottom line. And I think Salido can sock just a little bit harder. Yes. I think physical yeah, punch. strength <laughs> and punching power will be the difference. And Doug, Dimitri Sandrade has a lot of talent. A lot of people say... He is our best blue chip prospect out of this very disappointing Olympic class. He has been signed with Joe DeGuardi and Artie Palullo. And this is the thing that gets me about the development of boxing and talent and attractions. Here's a kid from Providence, Rhode Island who comes in with some hype. He's on national TV. But if you want to build a local attraction, why is a kid from the Northeast fighting in some casino, Indian casino, in Washington. There you go. I think that's one of the problems that boxing has. That's the has. economics of the sport. That's the desperate economics of the sport, is the, the people who are putting on these fights, they have to pay these fighters. Um, they, they're, they're not old school in that they're going to get out there and from a grassroots level, right. promote the fight to where there is local interest and they sell tickets and they make money from that. So their money has to come from a TV licensing fee, or in this case, from a site fee. fee. And, and that's why fight, uh, promoters go to casinos. It's for the site fee. It's like, okay, with this site fee, maybe I, I can break even without making a dime from the box office or even receiving any money from television. Doug, so that's why they do it. But you're exactly right. You have to go to faraway places uh, you know, for these Indian casinos. And a guy like Andrade, he could be a, a, a local attraction in the New England area. And Doug, let's just see how many people are going to actually show up in that casino at Washington. That's the thing. If you want to develop fan bases, you have to have the willingness and the money and the foundation to lose money or at least break even and say, you know what, there's a long-term plan. And with Demetrius Andrade, I hope he doesn't become an Andre Berto, a talented young fighter 
without a home. Doug, Daniel Ponce de Leon, we talk about rebounding from losses. He had a devastating loss this June against Juan Ma Lopez. This is going to be very interesting. The first time he lost, it was a 12-round slugfest against Celestino Caballero. This time, it was a one-round blow, which was very, very shocking. I wonder, psychologically, for a guy who believed he had a great yeah. chin, how does he bounce back from that type of devastating loss? Well, he loss? did have a great chin. I yeah. mean, it's not like Celestino Caballero can't punch. Daniel Ponce de Leon had been in with a lot of strong guys, a lot of guys with decent uh, punch. He doesn't have any defense. They landed right on his chin. He was never seriously hurt in any of his previous fights before stepping in the ring with Juan Ma Lopez. Lopez basically took him out with a single right hook. De Leon didn't know what hit him, mm. uh, didn't know how to hold on and survive, and he was taken out in one round. So that cloak of invincibility, it's been removed. And we'll see how effective he fights without the knowledge that he can take a shot, with the knowledge that, hey, I'm human, I can be hurt. He's a very proud man, and you know he's the kind of guy who can lose by decision as long as he puts forth yeah. a good effort. And if he finishes strong, he can hold his head up high, but he was wiped out like he was nothing. So it's going to be very interesting to see how what he looks like. Um, if he does look good and he can string together a couple wins, I think he still has a name. He can at least be a high-level opponent in the featherweight division. And, Doug, in the background, there are some changes in terms of his training situation and his locale. He's not with his usual training crew, and he did prepare for much of this fight in Las Vegas. Taking a look at some title fights in this upcoming weekend on Showbox Friday night in Canada for the IBF super middleweight title. Lucien Butte takes on Labrado Andrade. Then Friday in Japan for the WBA featherweight title. Longtime champion Chris John takes on Hiroyuki Inoki. And then Saturday in Germany for the WBA super middleweight title. Mikhail Kessler takes on Danilo Hausler. Doug, plenty of action going on at 168. How does the super middleweight division stack up as we speak? Well, it's a it's a very international division. I mean, there's people from literally you know every country, almost every continent in in the world uh, inhabit the 168 pound division. But it is a division without a champion now that Joe Calzaghe has stepped up to light heavyweight. Calzaghe, over his long reign, near the end of it, he had basically won all four major yes. titles. So he was definitely the man. Um, so we're without the, uh, a, a dominant fighter, but the most dominant fighter in Calzaghe's absence is Mikkel Kessler mm -hmm. from uh, Denmark. Uh, he holds the WBA title, and he's a former title holder with both the WBA and the WBC. Um, only one loss to Joe Calzaghe. He's got uh, a, a lot of skill. He's definitely number one. Number two, I have uh, a guy that uh, Mikkel Kessler beat a couple years ago from Australia, Anthony Mundine. Mm. He's a former WBA title holder, and he's won 10 in a row, Steve, since losing to Kessler in 2005. Number three, I have Butte, the IBF title holder. He is a Romanian with a, a very good amateur background, now fighting out of Canada, and he's a guy who sells well and is very popular there in uh, Montreal. He's 22-0, and 0, and we're going to see what he's really made of mm. against Labrado Andrade. Number four, I have a guy from Germany. Uh, he just recently won the vacant WBO title with a decision victory over the always tough Valencia Zuniga. His name is Dennis Inken, Steve. Mm -hmm. um, he's 34-0, and 0, and you know what, guys? He can fight. He's got talent. He's got technique. And number five, I've got the guy who's challenging for the IBF title. I have Librado Andrade, Southern Californian by way of Mexico. Again, his only loss is from Nickel Kessler. This lets you know how good Kessler is. He, he beats a lot of uh, solid fighters. Um, I think he's, he's uh, you know, what makes him special is how tough he is. You, you call him the, the Geico caveman, and mm -hmm. he's got that Neanderthal look to him, and he's got that Neanderthal style in the ring. But you know what? Since training with uh, Howard Grant, who is from the Montreal area, and he trained his brother, Otis Grant, who was a, a WBO middleweight title holder many years back, um, he's looking at, he's, he, there's a little bit of polish. There's a nice jab. Um, I saw some nuances, some uh, finer points of the sport with his win over Robert Steiglitz over this year, Steve. I think this is a very interesting Ooh. matchup between my number five and my number three super middleweight in the world. Doug, I think this is going to be a 50-50 fight, and kudos to Showbox and Gordon Hall for stepping up so that we can all enjoy this, at least here in the United States. Doug, I think Lucian Boot wins the early rounds, and I don't think he's quite as talented 
as a Mikhail Kessler. So I do think Labrado Andrade, unlike his fight a year or two ago, will be able to make inroads in rounds 6, 7, and 8. I just don't know if he can win a decision, even though he's becoming a little bit of a fan favorite despite being 3,000 miles away. I think Butte wins a close and controversial so decision. So do I. And, and, and I think it's controversial because I think one thing about Butte, He's a southpaw. Uh, he, he keeps his hands down, but he likes to keep his distance, Steve. Mm -hmm. He's got good legs, and he's got good lateral movement. He only employs that lateral movement when he can't hurt a guy. Yeah. And I th think we all know how tough Lebrado Andrade is. I think once he understands that he can't dissuade Lebrado from coming in, and, and he feels how heavy-handed Lebrado is, I think he's going to play keep away, Steve, particularly in the late rounds of the fight. But being at home, being the title holder, I think that um, he's going to win some rounds that are, are very close uh, in everybody else's mind and some rounds late in the fight that some folks might think should go to Lebrado Andrade because of his aggression. Uh, Doug, if I'm Lebrado Andrade and I'm Grant training him, uh, I work on one thing, cutting off the ring. And yes. when you're facing a southpaw, movement to the left, I think, is very, very important. If I'm Lebrado Andrade... He just can't thing, follow him around. No, absolutely. Yeah. The first four rounds, every single one of my punches is from the chest down, and I'm trying to work that body. I'm trying to take away his legs. Andrade has a margarito-esque quality to him. He's hard to dissuade, he's very, very solid, and he's very, very good very inside. Tough. Right, and he's a yeah. little bit of a slow starter. Yes. So he can't give up too many early rounds if, if he wants to win a decision in a very, very difficult environment. Doug, Mikel Kessler taking on Danilo Hausler. I think there's a couple of things here. Number one, Kessler is very good, and I think he's simply too good for Danilo Hauser. I think the word here is class. Yeah, class, natural ability. I mean, the guy is a natural fighter. He's been developed very well. He's got a lot of experience under his belt. And, 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 and the facts, his record speaks for itself. Only Joe Calzaghe has beat this guy. He has wins over the likes of Anthony Mundine, Labrado Andrade, uh, uh, Luca, the, the former Luka. title, Eric Luca. The guy from Germany, Marcus Beyer. I mean, he's beaten a good assortment of young, talented fighters, tough young guns, uh, experienced veterans and, and, and current and former title holders. He's, he's, he's one of the best stick and move guys in the game. He's got one of the best left sticks in the game. It's a sledgehammer. The only thing he's uh, sort of weak in uh, is uh, inside fighting. Yeah. He's not a good inside fighter. I don't think Hausler is known for pressure fighting and infighting. I, I think he wins this fight handily. Uh, without the presence of Joe Calzaghe, who I believe now is a full-fledged, full-time 175 pounder, uh, I think this man with the best jab in boxing, Mikel Kessler, is the world's best 168 pounder. Jo uh, Doug, Chris John takes on Hiroyuki Inoki. Doug, I expect him to win this fight and it sets up a showdown perhaps with Rocky Wars in the States on HBO in January. Good. I'd love to see that fight because I think, once again, Rocky Wars would be in with a very, very difficult style very in Chris difficult. John. Yeah, but you know, Chris John is undefeated. Um, I don't know how many title defenses he's made of that WBA strap. Um, I've seen two of his championship fights on tape. One was his win over... Um, Juan Manuel Marquez. You say I win. I say win yeah. in quotes. You got the decision. I thought Marquez won eight out of those 12 rounds. And the other uh, was a decision over uh, Derek Smoke Gaynor. And I actually thought that fight was even. I think he scored a knockdown of, of Gaynor, which gave him a one-point fight. Uh, of course, the, the scorecards there in Indonesia, where he's from and where he normally fights, were very lopsided for, for, for Chris John. I want to see how he travels. I want to see how he does where the judges don't already have the scorecards yeah. filled out, Steve. Uh, and, I, and I think that's an interesting fight late in there. But Chris John is a very good athlete. Um, he can, he, he's got good movement. Uh, he's tall and he's rangy. Those are the guys who are going to give Rocky Juarez right, trouble. In fairness to Chris John, I've seen some of his subsequent title defenses and against Japanese fighters who are a little bit built up and a little bit soft. But he's he talented. does look good. Yeah, he's he much more of an offensive force. But I think John Juarez is a complete crossroads fight for Rocky Juarez. You can't get over the cliff. You're Sisyphus, and you're never getting that boulder back up the hill. Doug, just in retrospect, I got to tell you, this past weekend, um, just being ringside and to see the Youngstown crowd <laughs> realize by the third round that, oh, my God, 
This is like the Fiesta Bowl and the Sugar Bowl with our <laughs> beloved Buckeyes. Yeah. There's nothing yeah. we can do about the onslaught the, coming the on. The writing was on the, wor and, the wall very early. And to see the media for about 10, 15 minutes all congregate and ask each other, did we just see what we just saw? And to have that look of amazement and stunning, uh, like this stunned amazement that, wow, we saw something special. I've said this before, even back in 2006 and 7. Bernard Hopkins, in my view, and I was scoffed at by a lot of people, was a top five or six middleweight, right up there with the likes of Monzone, Hagler, Greb, Robinson. Those are the guys. And, I would, those are the only guys I would put in front of him. And, and you know what? Here's the thing about Marvin Hagler, who I love. He's personally my all-time favorite fighter. What I've never understood is a double standard that people say, "Well, Trinidad was a blown-up welterweight." So was so Tommy, Tommy Hearns. Hearns. And then you hear... So was Sugar Ray Leonard. Then, then you also hear that, well, Bernard Hopkins, he fought in a very weak era of middleweight. So did Marvin Hagler. Yeah. There were a lot more caveman leads and Wolford Scott, see, there than Wolford than there were Rocky Graziano's and Gene Fulmer's. I think there's a double standard. And unlike a lot of those other guys that we mentioned, Bernard Hopkins has moved up from 160 and beaten formidable guys at 170, 175, yes. and at that age to be that effective, none of those guys were that effective at that age like Bernard Hopkins. No, no, they were done after their mid-30s, all of those guys. Yeah. I mean, they were, you know, after age 35, if, if they weren't already retired, they were, they were a shell of their former selves like uh, Sugar Ray Robinson. Doug, let me ask you yeah. this. Do you think that there were personality conflicts and personal stories, which obviously I have my own, but that clouded the issue that there were certain writers that Bernard rubbed such a wrong way, they had their own issues, that it clouded their view of Bernard Hopkins historically? Historically, maybe. Um, <clears throat> not so much going into this fight. I don't think that's the reason everybody uh, picked Kelly. Right, not everybody, right. but most people the picked Cal Kelly Zaggy Catholic. Fight the Cal Zaggy, and, and I think that's, you know, some of that is, is disrespect towards the Welshman. Yeah. It's like, you know, if you, if you don't have a super high opinion of Cal Zaggy and he beats Bernard, well, doesn't that mean Bernard's done yeah. or he's finally gotten old? Um, obviously not. I mean, you know, Joe Cal Zaggy has a higher ring IQ than Kelly Pavlik, obviously more experienced, and a more naturally gifted uh, and, and versatile boxer. Better on his than, feet. Than, than Kelly. Exactly. He has footwork and a ring IQ that's on par with Bernard Hopkins, and he was younger than Bernard Hopkins, uh, a slightly better athlete at that stage of their pro careers. Um, it's, it, it, as far as Bernard and his historical standing, I think his, his abrasive personality is part of the equation, Steve. I think the other part of the equation is that in recent decades in boxing, when we talk about all-time greats and pound-for-pound -pound fighters, we want to see great athletes. Yeah. We want to see superlative natural ability. We want to see Roy Jones Jr. We want to see guys who are absolutely dominant. We, want, we don't want to see grinders. We don't want to see blue-collar workhorses. I mean, it took people until the very end of Marvin Hagler's career yeah. to appreciate him. You know, in retrospect, everyone says Marvin Hagler was great. Same thing with Larry Holmes. You know what? When they were in the middle of their title reigns and beating good but unheralded fighters, no one gave a damn. Lennox Steve, because, Lewis, same yeah, thing. Yeah, because they were unspectacular. They were solid all around, but they were unspectacular. People didn't give a rat's ass about Marvin Hagler until that great fight with Tommy Hearns. Right. Hey, that was his, his, he only had two more fights after that, folks. So, you know, I think the thing about Bernard Hopkins is um, if he, he didn't have this win over Kelly Pavlik, I think he would have had to be retired for three or four years. And then in retrospect, people would have said, wow, this guy was great. But with this win, I think a lot of people, even his skeptics and even his critics, are going to say, you know what, he's not only a, a, a bona fide first ballot Hall of Famer, he's a great fighter. He's not only one of the best fighters of this era. He's a fighter who could have uh, got it on with the best of them in any era, the, Steve. Doug, here's the thing. Um, I think it's very, very ironic. He's getting his credit now, especially as a middleweight, in fights that aren't even middleweight fights. I find that highly ironic, but I've said <laughs> this. He got up to about 20, 21 defenses as a middleweight. Anyone that can do that in any division has to be given credit. And I'll take his roster of fighters against Joe Lewis and his Bum of the Month Club. But again, we talk right. about the double standard. Now, you talk about all the promotions. Joe Lewis was spectacular. Absolutely. He was knocking guys cold. Absolutely. And that's what folks want when right. they talk and, about all-timers all or, um, you know, uh, 
the pound for pound. They, people want to see Sugar Ray Robinson, Sugar Ray Leonard, Roy Jones Jr., uh, uh, Floyd Mayweather at at uh, at lightweight in junior lightweight. Right. They want to well, see Bernard incredible speed see, and Bernard power. Bernard and, yeah. is subtle though. He works I don't it. always appreciate yeah. that, but I've said this. If he does not have these legal snafus with Dan Goosen, Butch Lewis, Lou DiBella, oh, whoever, I think fucking he's, 30 uh, title that's defenses, exactly man. Because yeah. there were years he only fought once or twice. And Doug, one last point here. I know me and you disagree. Cal Zaggy Jones, November 8th, I think Bernard Hopkins did the greatest job of promoting that fight he, anyone could have done. Suddenly there's more interest in Suddenly it. there's more interest yeah. because the specter of that rematch against the winner, whether it's Jones or Cal Zaggy, Doug, believe it or not, if Jones should pull the upset 16 years after the fact, and about seven years after they basically 60-40 negotiated their way out of that rematch, if Jones should pull the upset, Doug, I know you disagree, 2009, I think that's the most highly anticipated fight in boxing. Uh, no, I don't disagree that that would be the most highly anticipated fight, and that's crazy considering that the yeah. rematch came 16 years after the first fight. And if you go back and watch the first fight, it was completely boring. Yeah. I mean, it was just, you know, it, don't watch the first fight because you may not want to see the, the rematch. Um, although the rematch would be very interesting because, because of how well-preserved Bernard yeah. is and the fact that Roy Jones Jr. has slowed down, at least in the feet department. Yeah. He won that first fight, folks, just by playing keep away. Uh, what I'm skeptical, what, what I don't believe, is that Roy Jones can beat Joe Calzaghe. Okay, let's say Calzaghe <laughs> wins, though. Calzaghe, Hopkins, in Wales, you draw 50,000 uh, people. Yeah, in Wales it makes Stylistically, sense. Stylistically, it may not be a good fight, no. but Doug, based on the form that he showed, I want to see Bernard Hopkins see if, if he can keep amazing us. Because let's face it, there was a feeling that I certainly had that this guy stuck around too long, I don't want to see him anymore. Right. Well, after Saturday night, you know what? I want to see him a couple more times. Let me ask you two quick questions. Somebody who was there and somebody who, who um, knows both of these fighters very yeah. well, both Hopkins and Pavlik uh, in, in recent years, and, and maybe you have a little bit of insight to their psychology. Based on this fight, do you believe that Hopkins wants to continue fighting? Absolutely. Made it very clear. Okay. He says, I got a lot more left. Wow. Also, he has a business interest in Golden Boy, and with him winning, that creates more of an interest for him and everybody. Richard Helps Schaefer, company, yeah. De La Hoya, and he has still got that fire. And it's when it's all said and done, like Joe Paterno says, why do you guys want me to quit coaching? What am I going to do, cut the grass? Folks, Bernard Hopkins is not a guy that's going to do yard work. He's a boxer. <laughs> this is what he loves to do. Okay, this is my second question. What was the mental state of Kelly Pavlik immediately after that devastating very, loss. How do you think he's going to rebound I from this fight? I think he'll be okay because I think he's going to realize, they're going to rationalize. He did have some illness. He had bronchitis. He had some antibiotics. And he also had an elbow injury. But he realizes the better man won. I got school. There's a lesson to be learned. I was in his room with his family and some other well-wishers. And he was talking to people. And he had to get something done. And he had, a, he had a joke. He said, you know, the doctor asked me what hurt. And I said, my feelings. So the guy is still keeping pretty good humor about it. That's good. He's not going to be the only guy that was beaten by Bernard Hopkins. There's no shame in that. And he can still secure his legacy by having a nice long run as a 160-pounder. Well, that's it for this week's edition of TNR on behalf of Doug Fisher and the rest of Max Boxing. Till the next round, goodbye, everybody.